your seats. We could maybe round people up from in the hallway. Um, so this is our closing plenary on science, access, and software. And I really thought that as we close out our 20th anniversary, it would be appropriate to um, sort of begin where we um, end where we started. Uh, I think it's the order I'm going in now. Um, and what that means to me is that ESIP was started by a recommendation from the National Academy of Science in 1998 to form a federation. Um, and we're wrapping up with, um, I think, some presentations, one from, the, one from the Academy of Science, one from work that was done there, and then with Heather Joseph on open access, which I really feel like is sort of the way of the future um, and you know where we're heading. So first, I just wanted to thank you all for your engaged participation this week. I think that coming in, I had no idea how this was going to go, if anybody was going to show up. Um, and I'm really happy that the right people were here and that the work that we did this week was really productive. All of the sessions that I was in, which was amazing that I was in sessions, um, went really well. And um, I got a lot out of the meeting, and so I hope that you did as well. Um, the timeline that we started last night is still up, so this is a his, you know, it's looking back at at least 20 years of making data matter, and somebody said to me, you know, is this bigger than just ESIP, and it is. I think that what we've seen is over the last several decades that data has become more and more important to our science, um, and so what I hope is that from this collection of um, items on that board that we make this digital timeline and that we have an understanding of sort of where we came from. So. More to come on that, but if you've got other things to add to that timeline, I'd really appreciate it um, in the next couple of hours. Um, there's also, there's a lot of um, kind of paper collateral stuff at registration. So there's an ESIP one pager, there's an education one pager, um, there's a bunch of postcards from different groups. There's one on the Google data sets. Um, there um, is just a bunch of good stuff there. So if you haven't been by to see what's there, I would say swing through. Um, and then also while you're there, um, there's still room on Christine's um, trading card to put your name on it, and we would love to have your name on that too. Um, so I think that that is, oh, the fire alarm. Um, <laughs> the fire alarm, they were finally testing the smoke alarms downstairs. Um, they weren't 100% sure when the fire alarm is gonna go off here, but it will go off today. Um, you've made it through. <laughs> Uh, but they think it's going to be this afternoon, so we might escape with no fire alarms. And again, if it's a real fire, they will come over the PA system and let us know. Um, and then the last bit is lunch today is going to be a buffet and there'll be a grab and go option. So if you're heading out to the airport, um, make sure to get lunch before you leave. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine White to introduce our first speaker. All right. Our first speaker this morning is Tom Arison, the Program Director of Policy and Global Affairs Division of the National Academy of the Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, since joining the National Academies in 1990, Arison has directed a range of studies and other projects on international sciences and technology relations, innovation, information technology, and strengthening the U.S. research enterprise. Recent projects include studies in open science by design, realizing a vision for the 21st century research, and fostering integrity in research. He was also staff director for the Inner Academy Partnership Report's responsible con conduct in the global research enterprise and doing global science. He served as executive director of the Inner Academy Partnership of for research from 2013 to 2017. Uh, may I invite Tom Arison up for our talk on open science at an inflection point. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Thanks to for inviting me out. Um, and uh, this is uh, their this is a very knowledgeable, engaged group. Uh, on these issues, and which is a good because it's a knowledgeable, engaged group that I'll learn a lot from in the discussion. But um, I'm a little concerned that I may not be able to say anything that is going to be new or interesting, but we'll see. So open science and an inflection point. Uh, I think when I submitted the title, it didn't have a question mark, and uh, 
last couple of days, I'm thinking, you know, I, I, uh, I added the question mark. So uh, I'm in between. So advancing, oh, I think I know. Right. So I'll just do a quick, quick little bit about the academies and Birdie. Uh, uh, talk mostly about the open science by design study that we released last year. Uh, just introduce the question of whether we're at an inflection point for open science and uh, mention a couple new activities and next steps that we're undertaking. Uh, the academies are private, nonprofit, self selecting membership organizations, three of them for uh, science, engineering, medicine that sit on top of us. Uh, we also have a congressional charter to advise the federal government uh, and we have, uh, so we're a private nonprofit. Most of our funding comes through grants and contracts to do from federal sponsors, but we also, uh, an increasing fraction of our work is done with support from private foundations, and we also have an endowment to self-initiate uh, things. There are six major divisions that are organized by disciplines for the most part, and we have several operating modes, uh, most of what we do falls into either consensus studies, which are committee authored reports with recommendations, convening activities such as workshops and roundtables, and operational programs like fellowships. The Board on Research Data and Information is a standing committee in the Policy and Global Affairs Division. The chair is Alexa McCray from Harvard Medical School. The director, uh, Alexa, was at the National Library of Medicine for a long time before that. Uh, the director is George Strawn, who was at NSF for a long time um, and would have been here if he <laughs> hadn't gone to Iceland. Um, uh, the mission of Birdie is to improve the stewardship policy and use of digital data and information for science and broader society. And uh, Birdie also uh, supports the U.S. National Committee for CoData. Uh, the Open Science by Design Realizing a Vision of 21st Century Research is a consensus study overseen by Birdie. Uh, Alexa McRae chaired a 10-member committee. It was released last year. The funding support was provided by the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. This is the committee. Uh, we had expertise from a range of disciplines. We had, uh, you know, including legal, uh, my apparel. We had uh, earth sciences, uh, astronomy, uh, economics and we also had computer science as well as different roles and, and experiences including research administration we got two vprs on the committee and uh, a great committee that did a lot of work and uh, brought a lot of knowledge and expertise to this task so so first we'll talk about this uh what the committee's focus was it was to identify and address the challenges of broadening access to scientific research and develop recommendations aimed at moving toward open science as the default for scientific research results. And the definition of open science that we were using is uh, open science aims to ensure the open availability and usability of scholarly publications, the data that result from scholarly research, and the methodologies, including code or algorithms that were used to generate those data. So the report covers the benefits and motivations for open science, which you're very familiar with, I think, um, that if data and methods are open, it, is, uh, it allows other researchers to check the work uh, and to uh, ensure rigor and reliability of the work. Uh, you can but through increasingly through uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, mining, you can find disparate data sets and uh, texts to link your, your data and your, to, to others and to address new questions, to find new hypotheses and questions in the data. Uh, it allows, enables faster and more inclusive dissemination of knowledge uh, inclusive uh, for research so that researchers in less research intensive universities and in the developing world have access and can participate more fully 
in research, uh, broader participation, including citizen science, effective use of resources, including uh, laboratory animals and human research participants. Uh, if you can reuse da data from clinical trials and from animal studies, it uh, gets more use and, and increases the contribution and allows you to, to, to get more out of that. And improved performance of research tasks, uh, fewer mistakes if things are automated. And public, open publication for public benefit, the idea that taxpayer funded research results should be available to public. There are barriers and limits that we know <laughs> that we've been uh, coming up against, including costs and in infrastructure, uh, of particularly for uh, long term stewardship and preservation uh, of data and other research products. The structure of scholarly communications currently most uh, publications are behind a subscription wall or a paywall. A lack of supportive culture incentives and training uh, where uh, open practices may be too difficult or perceived you know, in perception or reality is, is too difficult and costly or not beneficial to careers uh, and that that's a problem. Uh, there are, in, particularly in uh, fields with national security or that to be, to deal with pri personal identifiable information, there are privacy, security, proprietary barriers to sharing. There are disciplinary differences in the nature and complexity of research products like data. So open science by design, this is the end state that we, the committee um, came up with that uh, to conceptualize where we want to go uh, and that open science by design is a set of principles and practices that empowers the researcher to conduct research openly and transparently throughout every phase of the research process and the idea is that uh, if the infrastructure if the incentives if the systems and tools are in place then the the researcher will see the benefit of, of, of adopting and implementing open practices. They benefit from the uh, open availability of data and, and uh, publications uh, produced by others, and that they have an incentive to make their own work open. Uh, and this is the concept of the research process that uh, is put forward with the open science by design uh, concept. So we'll go through, there are five recommendations. Each of the recommendations has one or more findings. There's a recommendation and then there's a series of implementation actions for each recommendation. Uh, recommendation one concerns supportive culture and this is about incentives that uh, and goes primarily to research institutions and funders, but societies also have a role to play that uh, open practices should be better rewarded and supported uh, by funders and institutions. And there, in the implementation actions, there are a number of specifics for that. Uh, training, uh, the second recommendation concerns training, that there should be uh, more training for in open practices there's actually quite a bit uh, of uh, data management training, for example, <laughs> we saw the, in the posters outside and that this community is well aware of. Um, but there also needs to be uh, open uh, training and open practices around uh, code, around publications. Ensuring long-term preservation and stewardship, another item that you're this group will be very familiar with, where uh, the there needs to be a match. There needs to be uh, standards for what should be kept, what needs to be preserved for the long term, um, how it's going to be, who's going, who's responsible for stewardship, uh, and so the, and that's a responsibility of the researchers, the funders. Uh, you need to arrange this so that 
uh, long-term preservation isn't an afterthought or a long-term or an unfunded mandate. Facilitating data discovery use and reproducibility. And uh, this is about uh, open and, and fair are not synonymous. You can be fair without being open, I guess, and open without being fair. But um, in order to implement open science over the long term, uh, that it does uh, require uh, adherence to the fair data principles. And so that you know, also I'm, would uh, assume well familiar with that. Developing new approaches to fostering open science by design. And this is, uh, the recommendation is not, is, is very broad. Uh, the implementation items under this one mainly deal with, uh, deal with regularly revisiting and updating policies. And an example of that was uh, where the uh, Holdren memo, memos of 2013-2014, um, you know, we now have the uh, Open Act that was uh, passed recently that would maybe represent a, uh, the parts of this have been implemented with the passage of that act. Um, and also, the, some of the implementation actions deal with transitioning from subscription access to open access for publications. So this question of whether there is an inflection point, um, I think we see uh, that, you know, in various fields, and I think your, your work is probably at the forefront of uh, having to integrate and understand uh, different sorts of data uh, from from different sources and, and generated by uh, different tools and uh, sensors and, and, and so forth, that uh, the new generation of information technology tools and services holds the promise to transform practices in a number of fields. and, uh, and to, to be able to do this artificial intelligence and machine learning on, on data and text. That we have public and private research funders who've introduced mandates and support systems to ensure that the results of the research they sponsor are open. And we'll hear more in a little bit uh, from Heather Joseph about, about that. Um, publishers are adopting open frameworks and strengthening requirements to ensure that the data and methods underlying articles are available and uh, we have the open there. So the reason I have a question, <laughs> it's whether it's, it is an inflection point or not. Um, and I think it is, but um, I, I think that this open or open by design study, I think was the fourth uh, study focused on open access that called for open available data. I think the fourth one since 1985 that the academies have done that have kind of been a broad study. And then there are a number of more disciplinary specific studies that have been done. So we've been kind of at a lot of this for a long time. Uh, so it's a persistent multi-stakeholder international effort that's needed to realize this. It's an inter interplay of top-down policies, mandates, requirements, funding, community leadership in setting standards and taking ownership uh, and implementation of infrastructure solutions. And the bottom line is that the new, any kind of new ecosystem, new framework needs to work for the researchers. They have to see the benefit for their own work. They have to see that this is going to advance my career rather than this is, this is uh, something that's going to uh, get me in trouble or, or not advance my career or, or not worth it. So uh, Bertie, going forward, we're continuing to uh, try to do new projects and activities uh, to, to carry this forward. And one uh, new project is the Roundtable on Aligning Incentives for Open Science, uh, which will have its first meeting next month. And we'll be, you know, the co-chairs are Tom Khalil from Schmidt Futures and Keith Yamamoto from UC San Francisco. And that's a very exciting uh, activity that uh, the main input is provided by the Open Research Funders Group. 
we've worked uh, closely with Heather on that, and uh, we'll be able to say more in public about it uh, very soon. And the second project, realizing advanced and automated research workflows, and that's a new consensus study, which we are, it's going to look across disciplines, uh, and we are, we almost have funding for that. We have, the proposal is in, and I have been uh, told that it has been approved, and uh, so that will be, hopefully the money will come in soon, and that's a private sponsor, and we'll be able to announce it and start forming the committee for that. So, thank you. That's it. Um, uh, and uh, do I stay up here, or we do? Okay. How, how long was that? Right. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Really, really nice talk. And I think that you did have something to offer us. And it's, I think it's so refreshing and, or, you know, rewarding, I guess, to see that work that we've been doing here is reflected back there um, and that we're going the same direction. So we do have time for questions. So, um, questions from the audience? Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, Jeff Delabojovio from National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, so, you know, historically, the academies have made recommendations, especially the government agencies and universities. So, what, I wonder if it's feasible to make any recommendations to um, some commercial companies, in particular commercial cloud vendors, because a lot of the open science, you know, are, requires huge data sets, and there are potentially unbounded costs for storage, and data transfer, and computing. So forth. And it's, of course, you know, fair that if we're renting their stuff, we have to pay. But sometimes the pay-as-you-go model is difficult, especially for you know, governments or research grants that, you know, that you know, fix the amount and could get shut down and run out of money or whatever. So it would be useful to have either uh, reduced charges or kind of a, a, a prepaid, all-you-can-eat kind of of arrangement and sometimes they're, they are they do do that um, kind of individual R and D bases, but um, it might be interesting to see a recommendation for scientific data being somehow subject to a slightly different charging arrangement. Right, and I think that this report kind of dealt with those issues of cost and long term preservation in not superficial, but it was kind of a high level way. We didn't kind of do deep dives into the needs. And, and as you know, you have, there are certain, um, there are certain, you know, you have high energy physics where, you know, you're throwing out most of the stuff as soon, you know, when it comes in. And, but where kind of long-term access and preservation is built in, in, in a lot of ways, it's built into the cost of the project. And so, and then you have other, uh, fields where it's not like that. And so I think that th this is a great idea. Maybe we should explore either disciplinary dives or, you know, some look at funding models. Because I don't, I don't think that we've done, we might have done some disciplinary specific things, but um, I'm not aware recently of, of any that kind of looked at new cost models that uh, have been done since the rise of the commercial cloud. Hi. Hi. I'm Ann Wilson. I'm from the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. And um, one thing that I'm seeing that's a change in our world where we do research in space is that commercial companies are flying more and more um, satellite, you know, tiny satellite kind of things, and collecting data. And um, I'm just kind of wondering about that impact on the world. It seems like their focus is building cool instruments and launching things into space. But the data aspect is not on their radar, and they will sell their data, they will own their data. And I just wonder um, if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, not particularly. I can I can see and understand the the, the issue, 
but um, we didn't really look at I mean, I, I, and I think that the same thing is probably true, you know, not just with space, but with people yeah, flying drones around. And, and, and so um, that, that's, that's another probably very rich area to look at doing, doing work. Yes. Um, one thing I didn't, oh, I'm Ted here. Um, one thing I didn't notice in, in your description of the, of the Open by Design study was interaction or engagement with uh, scientific publishers. Um, right. So there are, yeah, there are a lot of recommendations for scientific publishers. Um, and where, and, and recognizing kind of the current landscape and um, the and that you, you know you have you have for profits you have non profits that work, work with subscription and you have um, you have open, new open journals and so forth and I think that th there's kind of a long discussion um, about new models you know for kind of publish first evaluate afterward and and the, you know kind of rethinking some of the basic things about scholarly or scientific communication uh, and and how that may impact uh, publishers and, and, and things they should be thinking about. So there are, in the specific implementation items and in the discussion, there's a fair amount. Were, were, were publishers uh, engaged at all in the discussion? And, and there the were, um, there were not any, there were several of the committee members had experience and editors of society journals for example um, and, and had, you know maybe and one one had a kind of current editor role but we didn't have any representatives of society or for-profit publishers they did speak to the committee so okay. thank you I'm Matt Merrick from the National Center for Atmospheric Research I want to go to one of your comments you said earlier about um, Gold report and some recommendations about um, increasing sort of openness and transparency on every phase of the, of the life cycle um, or of the research process. I think we have made a lot of progress on sort of the end products, uh, making those more open, although there's still a lot of work to be done there. But sort of earlier, you know, the whole scientific process making that open would be a huge, huge shift. Um, I think sort of counter to the way science has been done forever. Not just science, but sort of how people work, right? We never share everything. There's lots of reasons for that. I wonder if you could comment on those sort of deliberations about or recommendations related to sort of at what point is, is, is too much open, is there too much openness, right? Or is it totally unfeasible to be open and actually do science effectively? That's a great question. And I think that the report recognizes, and I think there's one, one basic thing is that the researcher should have control of when they share and when it's meant and, and with an understanding of what, when it's beneficial for them to do so. And the second point is that I think that there are disciplinary differences in this. For example, uh, pre-registration has become, it's required for clinical studies and is now becoming you know, in other ex experimental science fields, uh, it's becoming more and more common, like psychology. Um, and but it may not be appropriate or useful across the board. Uh, so it's I, I think that the the degree and uh, scope and uh, type of sharing that occurs, you know, may be different in different fields and, and across time. But again, it's, it's something that the researcher should be in control of. Uh, except, you know, maybe at the end where, you know, if, where if you're at the point you're trying to get credit, that's when you need to be uh, putting up. Thanks, Tom, one more time. Thanks. And I have, I have some, uh, we're a little fold over report briefs up here, so after the session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
time if you want to work with me. So now I'd like to invite Carl Benedict up to the stage to introduce our next speaker. So, so my presence up here is a, a clear illustration of ESIP's enthusiastic um, provision of opportunities for uh, leadership to immediately step in and start doing things. <laughs> That's right, and a, and a smooth and peaceful transition of power. <laughs> so I'm happy to, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Mark Parsons, um, who will be presenting our next uh, plenary uh, presentation here. Um, Mark is a senior research scientist at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, is also director of data science operations for the Tetherless World Constellation at RPI. Previously, he was secretary general um, at, at, of the Research Data Alliance and associate director of um, the Rensselaer Institute for Data Exploration and Applications. Prior to that, he was lead project manager at the um, NSIDC and at the University of Colorado Boulder. He has been involved in data management for more than 20 years, during which he defined and implemented comprehensive data management processes for many projects and organizations. He is active in multiple international informatics efforts and led the data management effort for the International Polar Year. Mark is a member of the Earth Science Information Partners Board of Directors and a member of the Coordinating Committee for the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines. He received the American Geophysical Union Earth Science Information Partners Charles S. Falkenberg Award. He earned his master's in geography at the University of Colorado Boulder. He has also served on the Committee on the Development of Strategic Vision and Implementation Plan for the U.S. Antarctic Program as an ex-officio member of the Board of Research Data Information and a member of the Committee on Archiving and Accessing Environmental and Geospatial Data at NOAA. So, um, and Mark is well known to this committee, or this, this community as uh, having been active for many years at ESIP. So I'm happy to uh, invite Mark to come up and uh, present on open uh, source software policy options for NASA, Earth, and Space Sciences. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Carl. I don't know that I even remember all that stuff. Um, so this is actually a really good follow-on to Tom's talk. So in this, this committee was running roughly in parallel um, with the other committee. And this committee is really getting down in the weeds, whereas that committee was looking at the broad overview. This was commissioned by NASA, um, so it's specific recommendations to NASA. Um, but I think they apply more generally. Um, and so there's the committee. I won't go through all of them, but in, uh, an array of um, really expert scientists in, from many of the different divisions of NASA. Um, and my, I do want to acknowledge my uh, co-chair, Shell Gentleman. Um, and it's, I think, interesting to note that the committee, they're all steeped in code. Some were heavy open code advocates. Some were very much open code skeptics, which made for interesting discussions. There's the report. Um, it's on the Academy website. It came out. Uh, late last year. Um, here's our outline. I'll give you a brief on the motivation. I think you guys understand generally what motivates us. Some background, some lessons learned, um, and then finally the policy recommendations and options. Okay, so I assume you all know this software is central to science. You've now had the chance to look at the pretty pictures. Um, and this is going to be in increasingly true as, as we go forward. Uh, at the same time, open source development is, is really expanding rapidly with more researchers using the tools and contributing to their development. Um, and so this is just an example of the whole ecosystem of open tools that have developed around Python um, and in many different fields. Um, and at many different le many different levels.
I'm going to skip this. Well, I'll show it for you really briefly. So this is just an example. It's a, a um, visualization of PyTroll, one, one of those um, examples from the Python ecosystem. And it's just a visualization of the work in GitHub. Um, and you know, these are people um, checking out little modules, checking them back in, um, developing the, and so you know, really showing the community in action, developing a, uh, a community code base. And of course, the science community is changing. Um, I think we see this particularly in Europe. Um, they've um, really been aggressively pursuing the open agenda. And this, so they had their fourth annual open science conference um, late last year. So this is not just a US thing, and that was something we wanted to impress upon NASA, because NASA is really a world leader. Um, and then there's the policy drivers. Um, there's, of course, the Holdren memo from 2013. You may not be as, uh, as aware that there was an OMB memo um, requiring agencies to consider the value of publishing the code they develop as open source, and actually encouraging a movement towards open source. And um, the NASA ch officer, uh, chief information officer responded to that in 2017, that they will comply and encourage vendors to use open source technology wherever is possible. We were not talking about vendors so much, we were talking about NASA employees and NASA contractors and grants. So here's our statement of task. In brief, we were asked to review and describe existing open code policies. There's surprisingly few. Um, develop a set of lessons learned from those. Um, and define and describe options for NASA to move forward and recommend a set of best practices. So before we even really got started, we, re we, think we recognized that you know, policy needs should serve a purpose. You don't just have policy for policy's sake. And so we, these are the goals that we recommended that NASA is trying to, that NASA is trying to achieve with this policy. And, it, and it's at times, um, you know, the goals are in contradiction to each other. You know, achieving one might hinder another. So that, there's that balance that you have to achieve. But the point we, we really wanted to get across to NASA is that it should be a goal-driven policy. And it should be in keeping with the mission of NASA. Um, so I won't read through those, but you get the sense. And, but the sort of guiding maxim, if you will, is that software needs to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So you are probably familiar, there's um, four divisions within the science mission directory. This, this report was specific to the science mission directory. Um, in simplifying Earth, Sun, planets, space are the four divisions. Um, and at our first committee meeting, it was really clear that um, these different divisions have very different cultures. They're in very different places um, in moving towards openness. Um, and so this really led to a much more complex response to our charge than we initially anticipated. Um, and I think it's important to note that academy rules um, require consensus. This is a consensus study. So we, for every recommendation, every finding in the report, we had to have complete consensus. Um, and as I mentioned, we had a very diverse committee from these all these different um, divisions. And um, and both open code advocates and skeptics. And so I think that was actually really good. It was challenging, but it was actually really good. Um, we learned a lot from each other. Um, and so I think what's unique about this report is not an open code advocacy report. We were basically coming in that NASA says, we're going open, how do we get there? So this is the getting into the weeds of how you get there. It doesn't pass any judgment on openness per se. I mean, we're generally pro-open. But it's, it's not, there's a lot of open code advocacy stuff out there. This is not it. This is actually the implementation of it. So this is the first step. We reviewed policy examples. Um, we re started with the four divisions within NASA. Earth science is really the one that's leading. Um, and uh, Kevin Wood is, I think, a big advocate of, of openness. And so the, the access call that some of you are probably familiar with within, within ROSES has very specific open requirements. Um, but there's no cross-division policy. Planetary similarly had um, some language in some specific calls, but no general policy. Nothing in heliophysics. Um, and a little bit in astrophysics, but again, nothing across the board, and certainly nothing across all of SMB. We also looked at other agency policies. Um, 
NSF. Um, so one of the and so these are the sort of lessons we learned from from those policies is that clear reporting guidelines are essential. That's something we, that was really clear from looking at NSF. But and an NSF struggles perhaps even more so than NASA in that there's not a coherent policy across the division. And in fact, I think you know it's program by program. It's really driven by the individual program managers. USGS does have a policy, and it basically says it, that the um, software shall be in the public domain. Um, and so that is because civil servants, uh, federal employees, are not allowed to assert copyright for stuff that they produce as part of their job. Um, and so USGS says, okay, just throw it all in the public domain. We didn't think that that was quite appropriate for NASA because of the array of contractors and um, the thing is when you put it in the public, to put a license on something, we'll get into licenses in a minute, um, it has to be copyright because license is built on, on copyright. So if it's in the public domain, arguably you can't um, put a license on it. And so that actually, it actually deters reuse in a sense because people don't understand really what the rights are. And it's public domain only in the United States. Um, and so it gets, it gets quite complicated. The legal landscape of this was very hard. <laughs> um, DOE actually has um, made some progress. Again, it's very lab by lab, but um, that they removed, um, this is shell slide, I'm not sure I understand the words, but um, the point is that you, if you assert ahead of time that I'm not gonna be uh, violating export control regulations or acquisition regulations, um, then you get approval in advance to go open. So it just accelerates the process. Um, and then of course we found that you know education is, is really um, critical, especially around these um, regulations of, around export control, acquisition, etc. cetera. Um, and the community model is really critical here. Um, open does not mean community code. Open source does not necessarily mean community code. But the best open source stuff is developed by a community as a community supporting. Um, I mentioned USGS. Um, and whoa, sorry, this is so we also look at data policies because there's a lot more data policies than there are code policies. Um, and one of the first big takeaways we got out of that is, is that software is not data. I mean, it is in a certain sense, but it's a lot more complex. Um, at the first level, you can patent software, you can't patent data for the most part. Um, so it, it adds a, um, a, lot, a lot more complexity. Um, you can copyright code, you can't necessarily copyright data. Um, and so looking at data policies though, we did, um, I think, derive some good lessons learned from that. And one is that um, by opening it, you get unanticipated applications, and that's, that's lovely. Um, and changes in policies um, change practices um, and leads to standardization if done, if, and done right. Um, and then as I mentioned with NSF, it's very much at the program manager level and so program managers are really essential to implementing any sort of policy. They have to be the ones that, are, they're often the ones that have to follow up. And that pilot studies are really useful. That's something that I, USGS found, and I think others as well. So, you know, and, I, and that, you know, don't require it all at once, you know, start with a pilot, see how it works, learn from that, and, and then move, and, and move forward. Okay, I mentioned the complex legal landscape, um, and so this, we actually started the committee and we did not have a lawyer on the committee and we immediately said, we need a lawyer on the committee. Um, and so that was really helpful. Um, and as, so as I mentioned, feds cannot copyright what they produce because of the Copyright of 1976, Act of 1976. Um, and that, but to be subject to a license, the work must be copyrighted. Um, so NASA has a open source um, license or agreement as they call it that uses contract law rather than copyright law. Um, it's widely not liked. Um, <laughs> and there is some concern that it is contradicts itself. And so 
NASA is working on the NOSA version 2 that's trying to address some of these issues. In general, we encouraged the use of more standard licenses where, um, where possible, but it may be that the feds, federal employees, cannot use you know, the more common licenses like Apache um, and so forth because of this the inability to have copyright. So I mentioned the copyright bit. The, the patent law, the Vidoil Law Act, um, gives the institutions when you um, the right to the patent. The intellectual property belongs to the institution, and so the idea being to try and foster innovation and so forth. Um, and so that also makes adds complexity, you know, into the researcher who wants to open their code if the institution owns the, um, owns the IP. Um, and so then, you know, we're driven also by NASA's mandate and federal directives and then other federal policies such as the acquisition requirements and ex export control. And this was actually really relevant, I mean, because NASA scientists are simulating nuclear explosions. And so you obviously cannot, you know, export that to uh, other countries. And then there's the grant and contract terms and general considerations for institutions. So then we gathered a bunch of information. We had two open meetings where we had a lot of people come and speak to us. It was really interesting. And then we also requested community white papers. Um, this is about a year ago. It was over the um, holiday period. But nonetheless, we got 44 community white papers, really well thought out papers. They're all available um, on the Academy website. They all have um, persistent identifiers. They're all cited in the report. 36 of them were generally positive, four kind of negative, four you know, then weren't really one way or the other. And so these were really what drove us in, to, in, in informing uh, our recommendations. And, um, and we took into consideration both the positive and negative comments, as I mentioned. So given all of that input, our first sort of central finding, if you will, um, is that NASA science community generally recognizes the value of open code supports the principles of openness, um, but there's a lot of concerns that prevail on the details of implementation and the impact on science and their most particularly on their careers. Um, oh dear. Um, so hence this recommendation of trying to build a community norm. To build a community norm, however, um, really requires educated participants, this, especially around this legal um, landscape. And so training and education on these issues are, are, is, is really critical. I'm hurrying now because I'm running out of time. Um, and these are the other recommendations that emerge from the community feedback. And this is what the, really the community values and needs to make things work. Often the hidden things that are critical to success. So you have to support the basic infrastructure. Tom mentioned that in the, in the general sense. Um, you have to support the basic connecting and broadly useful software with both funds and staff. Um, and that you need to recognize that there's different forms of credit for different types of work and that that needs to be addressed. So then we got into the policy options. And, and basically we said, given all this, we there, so this is really the third big recommendation. Um, that there's a variety of policy options that need to be implemented and um, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all, um, one policy starting tomorrow. It's going to be more complex than that. Um, and so you need to have con multiple options and continually assess. So at a very high level, these are the options. Just continue the status quo. Let the program managers decide what they want to do. Um, option B is trying to incentivize it. And option C is mandated in some way. Um, and, we'll get it, and so really, we start to flesh out option B. Um, is what, are, what are those incentives? And that you might, gra and then gradually moving towards the seed. So it's better to start with the carrot and then have the stick. The stick works much better if you have carrots in place first. So these are the options that we spell out for B. So fund open source proposals. You know, just have a funding call for open source um, proposals. Um, add have a little optional proposal add-on. NASA's done this for like education. You know, you get a little add-on to your grant to do some educational stuff. Maybe you can get a little add-on to your grant to um, open your code. Pilot software management plans. So we had a lot of talk about software management plans sort of akin to data management plans. Um, and so pilot that, see how it works, learn and move forward. 
really support that broadly useful code, those libraries, infrastructure software that everybody uses. Um, and because those are often community codes driven by volunteers and they need help. Um, create a prize. That is actually a pretty big incentive. Um, people are quite pleased when they get, a, get, a, get an award. So then we looked at categorizing the software. NASA actually has a category of software, and it's like everything from the mission critical stuff, the, you know, keeping the astronaut alive, to the mundane office type infrastructure software. We focused very specifically on the science software. We were told not at all to touch anything that you know messes with the instruments. Um, and so this is one way of looking at it. There's um, other things that might affect software policy, including the funding source, the parties involved, you know, community code might not just be NASA fundees, um, the size and the complexity of the software. Sometimes it's so big you can't necessarily share it. It has to run on a supercomputer. Um, but so the, I'll, I'll lay these out in a little bit more detail as we go forward. But these were the, the sort of categories that we started with. So then we took those options and then applied them to the categories. So the libraries and toolkits, we see this as a really high priority, and we should, we should employ all the incentives and try and get and move those as open as possible because of their broad, broad usefulness. Um, that single-use utility software that a researcher writes to generate a graph or something, that's lower priority. You know, that's, we don't have to worry about that, certainly in the short term. Maybe some targeted incentives if it starts to be um, more broadly used. The analysis, post-processing, visualization software, we see that as really high priority for the new stuff, but it's going to be a lot harder for the legacy stuff, the stuff that's already out there, and that's maybe a lower priority, um, and especially if there are external collaborators, because you've got to get everybody's permission before you can put a license on it, an open license on it. The modeling and si simulation software, this is really the complex stuff. Um, and it's going to vary by the scale of the, of the software, the community that's involved, how many people are funded by NASA, and so forth. Um, and in some cases, um, you may have to go back and rewrite the code. Um, the modeling frameworks, the stuff that connects the models, you know, so you have like an air, ice, ocean um, inter models interconnecting, those frameworks are really critical because people need to understand how they are making the connection. So we saw that as pretty high priority. Um, and really should be mandated for the new um, development of frameworks. Sensor and instrument data processing software is super high priority. You need to know how the data were produced. Um, NASA's already pretty good at that, um, but that's, that's really critical and should be mandated for any new um, processing. Infrastructure software, like the stuff that you use in your data center to manage your um, data, High priority going forward, but it's going to have to be case by case going back. It's really hard to change those embedded legacy infrastructure systems. So this is just a table. I won't go through it. This sort of lays out how these options would work in practice. You know how you might apply the different options to the different categories. Um, and then so finally, some recommendations on implementation. Um, this is maybe a no-brainer that you should not impose un unfunded mandates. Um, but the community is really worried about it. Um, and while open software is most useful when it has good documentation, versioning, testing, etc., and a strong community behind it, the basic act of releasing software is not that difficult. Okay. Um, they should use standard open source licenses, um, they should, and where possible, we'd, and, but not mandate any one particular license. Um, they should, this is the current software release process, and this is the simplified version. Um, they need to make it even simpler and allow for that pre-approval for low-risk code. Um, that's what that says. Um, so in summary, these six elements will be key to effective implementation. Um, program managers really need to um, be involved, um, understand these details. Um, but they need to implement it in a way that works for their program. Just within their community, there was a need for a lot of information sharing. Probably the same with um, the program managers. So, in short, norms and implementation require communication and sharing. Openness requires openness. So that's it. Thank you. There's a lot of resources, too. Thank you, Mark. Thanks.
Um, we do have time for one or two quick questions. Hi, uh, Robert Guerrero from JPL. I wonder if you could summarize the responses, the four responses that you've got with objections to the open source uh, software process. Um, I'm not sure this was the four, but the general concern that we heard in the white papers and from the community at large was that people had put a lot of their career into developing a uh, Suite of, so uh, suite of software, complex model or something, and for them to suddenly make that open, then people are going to have to take advantage of that and start publishing all sorts of papers using their IP. Um, we called it castle building, um, and we didn't like it, but we understand the motivation behind that. That's how a lot of scientists have built their careers by being the only one that has the necessary code to do certain things. Um, some scientists said we should really consider um, code much like we would consider uh, like an instrument, um, which might then actually lead us to the considerations of open hardware. But um, but that that was I think the core concern, and that and then the other big concern is that it was too hard, um, similar to like what we heard with open data. The licensing stuff is too complicated, and they're, and they're concerned that they would then have to be the one that supports it and have to build the community around it. Um, and I think that's very legitimate. Um, and so that's why we make the recommendations about infrastructure and support and education. Steve Young, Mark, thanks. I'm curious about whether the Federal Technology Transfer Act came up in your discussions, and you know, was there some thinking about how that might play in this whole realm? I think so. I don't recall how it how it works. I actually I have to go back and report myself. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I'll yeah. be around. I'm happy to happy to chat. This I, this is a lot of detail that I went through very quickly. Yeah, I'm curious about the, um, your, one of the, near the end, you said you didn't care which license they picked as long as they picked the license. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned, um, without having thought about it very hard, about the viral licenses like copyleft and, and uh, requiring attribution, not requiring attribution, but requiring that things remain open. And, you know, so in, in, in the spirit of public domain, it seems that the, the more open licenses, like the MIT license or the BSD license, might make more sense than then allowing people to go all the way to something like the copy left that, that really kind of poisons the software in, in where you can't mix from different licenses. Yeah, we had a lot of conversation around that, and that and there there there's a lot of support for the copy left licenses from sort of an idealistic moral standpoint. And I think that's fairly legitimate, actually. We had Richard Stallman um, present to us, for example. Um, but then that's partly why we said um, use standard or well commonly used licenses, but no, don't mandate any particular one. Most, most of the feedback we got encouraged the permissive licenses. But we recognize that in some cases, people will want to implement copy left, and that shouldn't necessarily be prohibited. But we really wanted to get away from those sort of vanity licenses special custom licenses is really what we want to do today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. I think that that was, um, that was really great. I'm, I'm impressed to see so much conversation and so many questions for you right, you know, right off the bat. So we'll keep that conversation going. Um, and Carl, I think I'd like to invite you back up to introduce our last speaker. So yes, um, I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Heather Joseph. Up our, uh, our final plenary speaker for the morning. Um, and this is particularly exciting for me as uh, I have 
over the past few years, uh, started work, working full-time in our library at the University of New Mexico, and have had uh, multiple opportunities to enjoy the products of Spark, the organization that she is the executive director of. For those of you who aren't familiar with Spark, it is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, an international coalition of libraries promoting the open sharing of scholarship. As Spark's director since 2005, she has focused on supporting emergency, uh, emerging publishing models, enabling digital archives, and promoting open access policies, nationally and internationally. Prior to joining Spark, uh, she spent 15 years as a journal publisher, primarily with scholar, uh, scholarly societies. She continues to be active in this community, serving on the board of directors for organizations ranging from the Public Library of Science to the Arcadia Fund. She is a frequent speaker and writer on scholarly communications in general and an open access in particular. So please welcome Heather up uh, to speak on exploring the role of journals in an open future. Thank you, Carl. It's nice to see you. Thank you all so much for including me in today's program. It really is a pleasure um, to be with you today. Um, and it's an honor to follow uh, both Tom and Mark uh, with two excellent presentations. We watch the work, track the work of the National Academies very closely at Spark, um, and uh, regularly um, try not to harangue, but gently suggest um, uh, 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 different pathways and, and uh, uh, moves uh, moving towards open. Um, as Carl said, I'm the executive director of Spark, and our um, end goal at Spark is really to set the default to open in research and education. And the, the programs and priorities that um, we advocate for are really to just kind of change that operating mode to when you walk onto a campus or into a lab, to have that mindset shift that you're going to share the results of your research, your tools, your educational materials, unless or until there's a compelling reason not to. So it's it, it's not black and white, um, but it is really a mindset shift that says the default mode should be sharing. Legitimate reasons not to, but let's start from that notion um, of sharing. And I think as Tom said earlier, we are really rapidly moving um, towards that end goal. And I think the world is moving into uh, an open science uh, uh, mindset. Um, and certainly uh, we work very closely with research funders, both public and private, all around the world and their recognition is, I think, fairly rock solid now that communication of results of research in particular is an essential and inextricable part of the research process. Um, and the pressure for the, uh, the, the, the end product, right, the communication of, of the results of research is growing from funders, which you all have seen, I think, on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Journals have long held a central role in um, this particular part of the research process, the research communication process, and signs are that that is, um, there's pressure on that, that process in particular to change. Um, as Carl said, I spent 15 years as a journal publisher, um, 14 of those years for scholarly societies and disciplines, ranging from starting my career at the American Astronomical Society uh, to working for the Society for Neuroscience and the American Society for Cell Biology, so multidisciplinary. I also took a year, I don't want to say a year off, I spent a year, I was recruited by Elsevier, um, and I worked for a year as a managing editor and an acquisitions editor in the commercial environment. Um, uh, did not make my full 12-month contract, came back to uh, Scholarly Society Publishing. Uh, my heart, my life, my, my ethos is in Scholarly Societies, and that's what I want to talk to, to, talk to to you a little bit about today is uh, some potential opportunities for our community, the library community, the funding community, and the scholarly society publishing community in particular to, to kind of rethink the role of journals in an open environment. Um, we focus on uh, the notion of open access. We've been doing uh, uh, advocacy for a move to open access for uh, the publication of articles for the last 16 years. And the notion of open access is really, for us, driven by the notion of opportunity, right? An old uh, tradition and a new technology, right? The old tradition of researchers sharing the results of their research without expectation of payment and a new technology, the internet, coming together to make possible something brand new and a new public good. And the public good that they make possible is really the free, immediate, worldwide distribution of articles reporting on the results of research or research results writ large. 
um, in an unrestricted manner uh, uh, and enabling full access and reuse to those materials. That's what we're driving towards, but that is, I, 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 I want to say this as strongly as possible, that's not the end goal, right? Open access in and of itself isn't what we're after. It's not open access to articles or busts to damn the consequences of how we get there. We want to keep our eye on the, the prize of using open and open access as a strategy, an enabling strategy in order to achieve some very specific things in the, the scientific research and scholarly communication environment. In the Budapest Open Access Declaration, which is the, the declaration that um, uh, defined open access and that we really use as sort of our guide star uh, for our programming and for our initiatives moving towards open, the, 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 the end goals that we're driving for are really defined as we want to use open access as an enabling strategy in order to accelerate research and discovery, enrich education, share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, right? Bi-directional inclusiveness of all voices and research and make this information as useful as it can be, uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. And it's this notion of a common intellectual conversation that I think we need to focus on when we think about the role of the journals have traditionally played uh, where we sort of pigeonhole them as publishing rather than communication tools uh, and, and think about opportunities for opening up um, opportunities to rethink that mode. As I mentioned, um, I, I know <laughs> uh, everyone in the audience is feeling it, we're feeling increasing pressure from funders who are looking at uh, enabling open communication of research results, particularly data, but also articles in specific, uh, getting more and more aggressive. Um, and that's good and bad, right? I mean, I'm not going to lie, right? Our goal is to make open the default. We're driving towards open access. We want to get to that goal. We recognize that uh, policies like uh, Plan S coming out of Europe, um, which mandates from 14 major research funders that people uh, Researchers who receive funding from those agencies have to find a way by January 1st, 2020, to make the articles that was report on uh, the results of that research openly available um, and are generally starting to, to really put pressure to say you need to figure out how to publish it in an open access journal or somehow, some other way, make uh, those articles available under full open access Full open access conditions, right, are no, I think they, they were they were debated for a long time, but with the funders putting out very clear mandates like this, there be, the, those conditions are becoming clear. We've said for a long time, Budapest uh, Declaration, Berlin Declaration, talked about open access being the free immediate availability of articles on the internet, coupled with the reuse rights, uh, the rights for people to reuse those articles fully in the digital environment. Read only is not open access. Uh, the ability to access and read coupled with full reuse rights under a Creative Commons CC BY or CC BY um, uh, NC license is really the, the direction that, uh, uh, or the definition of open that we have used. And now the funders are really starting to say, this is, the, this, this is what we need when we're talking about open access. Um, there's an increasing pressure, right, because of policies like this for society publishers then to think about flipping their current journals into an open access model, right, to say this is the route that uh, when, when funders are talking to us about in 18 months, we have, or now less, um, in 12 months, the, the pressure is on for us to provide an avenue to our researchers to be able to make articles available under these terms and conditions. Immediately we start, we see scholarly societies start thinking about, I've got to have an avenue for, in my journal, for people to, to, to publish articles under these terms and conditions. And we're seeing all kinds of um, conversations and initiatives that are centering around putting pressure on societies to figure out how to take your existing publication and just flip a switch, right? Turn it into, uh, in, in, in open access, an open access uh, publication. And in general, um, that means looking at a way to take your subscription revenue and replace it with something like article processing charges. 
Yet the co most common question we get is, well, what's the, how do we do that? What's the business model that allows us to move into an APC supported journal model with the flip of a switch? And there is no silver bullet, right? There is no answer to that question that says you can do that without missing a beat or losing, risking revenue. It, if, if there was a way to do that, that would you know, magically allow us to flip a system on its head and do it, we would have advocated for that and you know, we'd be there now. The, the honest answer is that there isn't. And that is really scary and I think that's the source of a lot of angst and pressure uh, that, that uh, we've seen coming from, from scholarly publishers. We share that in the library community. We, as library uh, academic institution libraries, research and academic libraries, we represent about 80% of an aver average journal publisher's revenue, right? We are the customer base. Um, and I'm also not gonna sugarcoat it, right? We are very happy to continue to be the customer base for scholarly societies who have traditionally acted as academy-friendly players. We consider you partners. We consider uh, ourselves uh, supporters and we want to continue to be. Commercial publishers who are reaping 20, 30, 40% revenues, not so concerned about how they will fare in an open access world. Uh, but but society publishers, not profit, not for profit publishers, university press publishers, very concerned about thinking about a way through this morass that gets us out of this box of of, of flip. What we've increasingly been talking about, thinking about, and working on um, at Spark is: Do we really? Is is it really uh, are in our best interest? Is it really what we want as an end game to simply flip? the existing system that we have in place on its head in order to get more open access articles? And our answer is really an unequivocal no. That is not what we're looking for because when we're honest about the current publishing system, scholarly publishing system, it isn't just uh, high prices for subscriptions coming from commercial publishers that are problematic. There are lots of other issues that we would like to take this opportunity to work with the community to correct. There's voices that are systematically prioritized over others. There's bias in our publication process. There's lack of transparency. There's conflation of publication with impact and career value. There are all kinds of other components in this system that we have the opportunity to look at utilizing open as an enabling strategy to, um, uh, to, to correct. So when we think about the, the, the pressure that's in front of us, the, the uh, maybe the problem that we need to solve or the opportunity that we have. What we're focusing on is how can we use open to truly transform the way research is conducted um, and shared. And we were thrilled when the Open Science by Design report came out from the National Academies because as we heard from Tom, this is really the focus, right? To enable a new ecosystem where openness is part of the ethos of the process of the full research cycle. Um, and that is indeed our focus at SPARC. So how are we going to do this? We've tried to flip the switch in our heads to think about doing this by empowering ongoing scientific and scholarly communication and not just scholarly or scientific publishing, right? Thinking sort of beyond the journal as the sole mode, the sole container. This is not a slam on journals or the value of journals, but rather I think a recognition that journals serve a purpose, um, but they should not, they have not um, been uh, foolproof as the sole and single currency of impact and advancement in uh, scholarship uh, uh, in the United States or internationally. So what about a vision of supporting an entirely new set, well, I shouldn't say entirely new, of supplementing, uh, augmenting journals with a new set of communications platforms or channels where content and contributions of all kinds across the research life cycle can be shared in real time and where truly new ways of prioritizing and valuing those contributions and kinds of content can take place. Um, we are trying to come up with a, a crystallized way to express this vision and we're, we're kind of working on community input. So this is a work in progress and we welcome input and feedback on this as we're developing it right now. The way we're trying to express our vision is what we're trying to work towards is moving from the sole focus on scholarly publishing to an open ecosystem that ensures that the production, sharing, and use of all research objects across the research life cycle maximizes the global public good by being rapid, transparent, equitable, and inclusive. 
Um, we're, we're using open as an enabling strategy. We're not saying all these things need to be open on day one, but rather that this ecosystem uh, be uh, enabled by thinking about the use of open um, at, all, at all these, these places. And a key starting point for us in thinking about enabling this ecosystem is the idea of starting out with rethinking these platforms where, the, where research is communicated, thinking beyond journals and thinking in terms of infrastructure and academy-friendly or community-owned or controlled platforms, controlled by stakeholders who share our values, universities, uh, funders, scholarly societies, libraries. We see kind of expressions of these platforms being promoted by some of the research funders who are really, really aggressively moving into open uh, requirements for openness to promote open science and to promote openness in their research practices. Welcome is one example um, who has uh, created its own communications platform. The Gates Foundation uh, similarly has put in place its own communications platform. The European Commission uh, issued a tender and will ultimately be building its own platform for communication of results. And that means results shared in real time, well beyond articles, preprints, data, code, algorithms, all of the kinds of things that the Open Science by Design report that uh, Tom discussed and the kinds of software products uh, that Mark discussed. If you're funded by these researchers, this is an option for you to an option right now for you to use as your communications channel. Could it potentially be re required by funders in the future? Certainly, that's a possibility. This idea of platform, of large scale um, uh, shared community owned platforms is being echoed by the university and library community in terms of a, a large scale call for institutional repositories, which have been traditionally used to simply house versions of articles to transform themselves into or be transformed by the community. I wish they'd transform themselves. That'd be really great. A little magic wand there. Uh, but to be transformed by the community into these kinds of sh uh, shared platforms. Um, and that's great. And in that vision, you know, I think it's wonderful. But the thing we, we, we recognize and we hear the most is great data code algorithms, all these different elements. If all of these things are just up on platforms, right? If they're just, if you're just required to put them up, sure, it's great to share. But won't we just end up with chaos? I mean, won't it just be this, you know, sort of free for all? Possibly, you know, I mean, that's certainly a, 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 an initial starting point. But we think that this also is a unique opportunity for the people and communities we would traditionally then turn to, to for help to make sense out of this chaos. And that is disciplinary expertise resident in scholarly societies and similar communities. Um, and, and that is the unique value proposition of scholarly society, right? It's the community, it's the disciplinary expertise, it is this kind of, of um, uh, functionality that really gives uh, scholarly societies their, offer, their, their unique place in this ecosystem. And as the library community has Spark, we are very keen to think about and work through on a pilot basis, on, you know, on any basis that we can, new kinds of direct fee-for-service models with you for providing the central functions, right? That expression of that disciplinary expertise that you have traditionally done in terms of the peer review bundle on, just on journals and looking for ways to support that uh, functionality by applying it across all kinds of content at all stages of the life cycle on open platforms. So talking about the registration, validation, prioritization, awareness raising, all the things that are sort of resident in peer review and the scholarly communications functionality that right now societies tend to just concentrate on, on performing only in journal packages. We would like to look for ways to say, let's lift that up and work with you on transitional strategies to, to, to move and uh, 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 mitigate the risk of moving from thinking only about journals as the communication channels to uh, thinking about this new openness. I think we have a really great opportunity. We've been working very closely in the library community with the research funder community. Tom refers to the Open Research Funders Group. For the last two years, Spark has been meeting with research funders ranging from Wellcome and Gates to uh, Robert Wood Johnson, Arcadia, uh, Sloan Foundation, you name it. There's 14 major private foundations uh, every six to eight weeks, talking with them about their priorities and their vision and looking for ways that we can collaborate in a real pragmatic way uh, to help facilitate a transition towards this shared vision. 
And we have a lot of experience, believe it or not, in the, in the library community and in the Spark community, working with scholarly societies, facilitating these kinds of transitions. Um, uh, in 1999 and 2000, we actually worked with scholarly societies in a similar way to raise venture capital from our libraries to help scholarly societies stay independent from commercial control um, when we wanted to, when societies wanted and needed to move from a, a solely print-based environment and into a, um, an electronic environment. And we've worked on transition strategies that are multi-year, uh, in, that include financial support, again, in the form of venture capital from, from uh, the libraries for uh, making that tra transition. We've created risk mitigation strategies uh, and worked on sort of win-win value propositions based on alignment of our shared values. Um, the, this is the, the, the kinds of transitional strategies that we did uh, in that, that mode of moving from print to electronic don't translate, you know, one to one uh, from subscription to um, uh, uh, non-subscription environments and journal to non-journal environments. But we see enough of uh, a blueprint that it makes us confident and, in fact, kind of eager as a community to look for opportunities uh, to work with scholarly societies to, to move in that direction. Thinking about just flipping journals offers limited options, right, I think is my, my bottom line. Thinking about leveraging the community, whether it's a society or a group of society or a community of you know, multidisciplinary experts, thinking about leveraging that community's unique value proposition beyond journals will open more doors. And one of my, my bottom line messages, the library community and increasingly the funding community is ready, willing, and eager to talk about ways to working with you to support that transition. So thank you very much. Love it. That was an amazing way to end the plenary session and I think it's so exciting to think about how research could be one of those communities that we work with. And I really thinking about how this flips and thinking about more research objects. I feel like everything we've talked about this week has sort of led up to your talk. Um, so Great. Super nice. Um, so we have time for some questions. Hi, uh, Bob Jones from Season and CDAC. So uh, this is great that uh, we see this transition taking place. And as you might know, the uh, Domain repositories have been doing this for some time. And now you see the libraries are starting to move forward on this. And they're really enabling the publishers for some time, uh, for like 500 years. Uh, and I'm just wondering what you think about uh, how domain repositories fit into this transition. Domain repositories are, are exemplars, I think, for us, right? So the, the direction that uh, uh, domain repositories have have kind of laid out for the last decade and a half and even more. Um, really, I think if, if we could turn back time and say uh, when Budapest was created, rather than you know maybe investing in, and I say this as a, a former board member and a huge supporter of the Public Library of Science, which did a proof of concept, which was proof of concept that you could do open access in a journal publishing environment. I think if we had spent more time working on enabling more fully enabling the, the um, domain repository environments as workspaces, we'd be farther along uh, uh, the open access pipeline. So I really do view them as exemplars. We work very closely with them. We look uh, uh, for lessons that we can take out of that space and apply more broadly um, as much as possible. And we do partner uh, fairly closely with some domain repositories. We'd like to do more, especially around uh, understanding data and code in particular, and how um, intersections and interoperability can be enabled a little bit more fully in those sort of places of needed intersection. First Wilson, Oak Ridge National Lab. So I offer this question in the vein of, I don't want this tail to wag the entire dog, but I spent 18 years in private industry where only a fraction of my research made it into the literature. I work in an environment where we do research with industry and some which is classified. How do you see those environments playing in what you're saying? It's a really interesting question and it's it's a, a place that we've been spending a lot more time kind of backed into the notion of getting a better understanding of how industry 
interacts in this ecosystem? What is the role of industry in this ecosystem? Uh, by working with um, a group called the Data Coalition, which is a uh, advocacy coalition of companies that are built on publicly available US data, some scientific data, but not entirely financial data. Uh, we've been working with that coalition for the last two years, really trying to get an understanding of um, what, what the, we under, I think we, we, we understand relatively robustly the interplay of academic institutions in, in this environment, but you know, not nearly enough in, in terms of, of commercial entities. But by partnering around uh, uh, shared interests in open data and being able to express to each other what we see as the value coming out of uh, requirements from open data around advocacy, frankly, for the Open Government Data Act, which miraculously was just signed a couple of days ago, <laughs> three and a half hours to go before pocket veto deadline, might I just say, kill me now. Um, uh, it's helping us build an understanding. We are all ears for other strategies and things, people that you think we should be talking to, companies that are progressive and that are feeding into this ecosystem in ways that we can understand better and, and take advantage of. Thanks, Heather. Great talk, as always. Um, one of the concerns that I've heard from publishers going towards open is that it changes the financial and that author, um, author processing charges encourage them to just accept more papers. And so that might damage quality. And I could see the same sort of thing potentially in your more sophisticated fee-for-service model. Do you have thoughts on how that might be addressed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in it, it, if we broaden out the objects that are included in the incentive and reward structure, that risk is somewhat mitigated, right? It's sort of spread across a larger set of potential objects. The, the, I'm not a fan of APCs, so I'm just, so I'll say it flat out. I think staying in an APC supported journal environment is gonna just, we're going to, we run the risk and I, I would say, I think we would be in a system where we now replace a problem of access to information uh, scientific information with a problem of participation in science, right? Because if you can't afford to pay an APC to get your paper published, your voice will not be heard, and that's not acceptable. So the idea of looking at inclusivity is has dividends, pays dividends in a lot of different ways. It increases the number of voices that are included and the number of the kinds and number of objects that can be fed into uh, an, an assessment and an incentivization process and spreads the risk to a certain degree. Um, I don't know what the perfect model is, and that's why I think, and I don't think there is one. I'm gonna, I think I cannot wait to go back through your report and look at it through sort of the filter of, yeah, one size doesn't fit all in terms of the soft, of software policies. This kind of business model, one size isn't gonna fit all in terms of what the charging mechanisms look like in fee-for-service. We have some initial ideas, though, for sure. We've been looking and working with, actually hired a, um, a former Wall Street market analyst who covered the scholarly publishing industry for 15 years last year to come and work for Spark for a year, and we just got funding to renew them for two more years. So we want the sophistication of people who create market models for a living working with us. I don't know if this is gonna make you feel better or worse, but this guy, he's great. Um, besides, before he was a market analyst, he actually well, he was at McKinsey and Company and did all kinds of uh, business practices for other industries but he served as the head of digital strategy for EMI Music at the time when music went from digital uh, to analog to digital. Uh, so he has lots of experience with different kinds of, of models and, and um, that it, it's gonna be an interesting opportunity, I think, for us to talk with and work with communities to do some modeling around what might work and what might not. Do you have time for one more? Okay. Yeah, hi. So I totally support open access, but one thing that does concern me is peer review because for better or worse, the journals have been sort of the gatekeepers of that, right? Remember the old days when open access meant you mailed a paper preprint to somebody in another country or whatever. But, you know, these aren't, this isn't music, these aren't blog posts. You do want some level of peer review, and right now the journals kind of manage that whole process. Sometimes flawed, but that's how it is. So, you comment on, on how we do peer review and just a purely put it in a repository kind of model. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what Open Science by Design lays out are different options or opportunities for thinking about the timing that peer review takes place and maybe the sort of different flavors that peer review can uh, uh, can come under. 
I can 100% see journal branded or society branded peer review processes being applied to different objects for different fee for service models. I mean, that is what we're talking about. We're not talking about just slapping stuff up and saying, you know, let, let the devil take the hindmost. These things will buy for, for, for their own. I could completely see an AGU branded peer review process uh, post publication for certain objects pre-publication for certain objects. I think that's what we want to look at, are ways to preserve those functions that have value, that absolutely have value, and try to more directly assign, though, the value and the payment to that process, rather than saying it just all gets thrown up under the bundle that is the journal. Um, yeah, I think peer, I want to follow up with that, I think peer review is a key issue to this entire thing. Yeah. When will the funding agencies start including line items to pay peer reviewers in their awards? We'll see, right? So I think part of what, what we, we have an opportunity to do is the funders aren't just issuing these mandates for moving towards open in a vacuum. And they're not doing it lightly. And they're not doing it pretending they know everything. I mean, I would say if you could be inside any of the conversations with the Open Research Funders group, you'd see a group of concerned uh, individuals who have an end game that they they know they want to get to but they worry all the time about moving too quickly or disenfranchising or losing uh, quality control or, or uh, pieces of the process that are valued I think the roundtables that Tom talked about the Academy is promoting are bringing together the heads of research agencies funding agencies public and private and university president presidents provosts uh, uh, VCRs together to talk about the current system of incentives and what should be value. Part of the conversation of, of value isn't just tenure and promotion, it's what do we pay for? So I would say over the next three years as this, these roundtables go forward, this is a, a question that's going to be central to uh, the funding community and the university community to figure out. The funders want to continue the flow of money coming to your campuses. Funders want more openness. There's friction in payment and, and, and in tenure and promotion. The, these roundtables are designed to say, what can those two parties do together to begin to take the friction out of that system? So that will be a question that I would say, I would hope would be addressed head on and honestly. Maybe a bit of fun here very quickly, sorry. Can you, are you able to put a historical perspective on whether a form of open access existed. Um, maybe when Stephen Hawking's published his PhD, right? Yeah. Um, what happened before the big warehouses were there and people pay in or publish into and everybody pays to see? Surely that didn't always exist. Are you able to provide any, um, your opinion on how things change to get to where we currently are? And are we going full circle to going back towards a form of open access that did at one time exist? Yeah. I, I, you know, I, open access didn't exist before the internet, I will say, except sort of theoretically. I mean, really, Budapest, I think, captured it perfectly. It was, the internet is the enabling moment, the transformational moment. We have not fully taken advantage of it yet. I don't think we're going to go full circle back to a time where, you know, this stuff get, is, is wedged behind paywalls. I think it's, I, I feel like it's inevitable that the community is now speaks, beginning to speak with much more of a unified, unified voice saying more sharing, more openness is better rather than maybe not all the time, but the direction the needle is moving towards open and not close. So as we head into our coffee break, um, Carl just has a few more quick comments. Um, and I think, you know, Tom, you started off the session with, are we at an inflection point? And I think that the, the whole session, I just was sort of thinking, yeah, I think we're at an inflection point. Um, so I really, I appreciate all of the speakers' um, willingness to, um, to come today and to have this really interesting conversation. And it's one that I think the, the thought of incentives um, is really exciting that we're finally going to see incentives working in, I think, ESIP's favor. Um, open data and making data matter.
And we have had a lot of remote participation in this meeting, so thanks for bearing with us through that as well. So yes, thank you, and also for uh, for staying all the way through. And uh, we have uh, one more set of uh, sessions and lunch following this, so uh, don't leave quite yet. Um, but this is our last opportunity to all of us be in one room. And um, the, the, the topics we've heard about this morning have reminded me of the benefits of all of us being together and having opportunities to new, learn new things um, that aren't necessarily at the core of our experience or knowledge. And that is actually one of the great things about the platform that ESA is, is an environment where we have such a diversity of experience and interest and it, we have an opportunity to learn from that diversity by actually expanding our interactions within ESA. And that's certainly something that I want to try to look at strategies to exercise over the next year um, in ESA is trying to identify models and approaches where we can branch out and, and exercise our curiosity in what other work and interests and exp experiences are available within the ESP environment. So as, as we move forward through just these very, uh, these last closing remarks, um, I want you to think about that as we move forward over the next year, is be curious, engage in new parts of ESIP that you maybe haven't explored before. Look for new ideas and concepts to expand and make new connections, because it's really the connections that we make within ESIP that, that define what ESIP is and, the, and in many respects the benefits that we all get from participating in ESIP. Um, as we move forward into the next year, um, we have uh, the benefit of continuing leadership and new leadership coming into the organization. But it's important to recognize, and I'd like now to thank our um, outgoing leadership for their important work in this, this, this first year of a transformation of our leadership and organizational structure and working through what, what can be challenging, but I think what has become a very productive and much more unified model for ESIP as we move forward. So I'd like all of last year's leadership that are still here to stand up and be recognized. And I'd like uh, this year's leadership that are, that are coming into their new offices to also stand up and be recognized so you'll know who to, uh, to ask questions of. So as you have new ideas and suggestions about how we can improve as an organization, um, idea, you know, great new, um, new initiatives we can look at, new ways that we can collaborate, new collaborations we can build, our leadership is certainly where you can where you can come to, to point those out and, and, and highlight them, but it also is an opportunity for you to come forward and engage yourself and you know, join our leadership, join our clusters, jump into our various opportunities to engage with, with the group. Um, we have many opportunities to collaborate, and you can see these are all of our different um, methods for uh, being active in ESIP, and it's really that activity that pays the benefits. We heard in the very first plenary that you get from ESIP what you give, and that continues to be a key um, dynamic here. We can, we can learn by passively sitting in rooms. We can gain some insights, but it's really through the exchange, the active exchange that ESIP brings that we gain the most benefit, and we have the greatest impact. So I encourage you to engage in any or all of these ways over the next year. Go uh, dial in to a cluster call that you've never engaged, that you've never participated in before, just to learn what, what else is happening. You're likely to find out some new things that will apply to what your interests are and maybe identify some new approaches to solving the problems that, you're, that are closest to your heart and your interests. We're of course going to be kicking off our next round of planning. How do we architect these interactions? This is the work of our visioneers. So keep an eye out for the call in the coming just couple of weeks as we start our next, our next, 
Uh, is it time for the fire alarm? <laughs> I'll be quick then. So keep an eye out for a call from the Visioneers to participate in our planning and design process around our in-person meetings because they are designed activities and we want your input on those. And our Visioneers do that. Finally, mark your calendars, block them out, make your plans to join us in Tacoma next July 16 through 19 for our Summer ESA Federation meeting. Um, and then pay attention to what the Visioneers are doing in terms of developing a plan and a structure for that upcoming meeting. But definitely get it on your calendars now so you can make sure not to miss it next summer. With that, thank you everybody for coming. And, uh, <laughs> and um, also I want to make sure to thank the, uh, the ESIP staff who have gone to great lengths to um, make sure that this meeting has come off as absolutely smoothly as, as I could have hoped. <laughs> Uh, Dan, Annie, Aaron, and Megan <laughs> um, have gone to great lengths and, and tremendous effort to make sure that all of this has happened. And I'd like everyone to join me in thanking our staff. with that before they shepherd us out of the building with some loud uh, noises. Thanks again and uh, we'll see you in Tacoma. <laughs>